Aloha, welcome back at Cyber Underground. I'm your host, Dave Stevens. Here at Cyber Underground, our mission is to dig deep to find out how cybersecurity touches all of us in our everyday lives. Today, we've got a special treat for you. We've got a co-host that used to be a guest, Mr. Perfect, Jeff Milford. <laughs> and welcome great. back. He's the president you. of ISC2 Hawaii Chapter. And our guest, Mr. Russell Sini. And Russell, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, I've been in computers for quite a while. Um, so your first time out? First time out of computers. I mean, it's. I know it's a little studio, but were you inside a little computer? Is it a big computer? Is no, it's a pretty big computer. Good computers. Okay, good. <laughs> Built my first computer years ago. You know, like, and then uh, was in the army. Went to Ethiopia, and we had a deep space tracking station. We were watching the other guys. Uh, we had, you know, really good tracking. You know, like it was kind of neat. And worked at NSA for a year. You know, like, and then my parents moved over here, so I moved over with them, and been here ever since. So where'd you go first in, in the United States, in the mainland? Or right oh, I, was on the, I was living on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, my dad was in the Army, so we moved around. Uh, but you know, I, I was living in the D.C. area when I went into the service. Uh, I was in the Army Security Agency, so I've been doing security stuff for years. Pretty much your whole yeah. life now, yeah? <laughs> pretty much. So you're pretty good at it by now? <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> well, that's, that's good enough for us. Yeah. So um, when, when did you come to Hawaii? Uh, 1971. Oh, wait right out of, yeah, That's right great. out of, yeah, I, I told you I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, but like, been doing uh, computer stuff all this time. Uh, like, and we actually uh, started up our computer company in 33 years ago. And what, which company is that? Uh, Pacific Business Services. And you're and, still doing that? And we're still doing that. Good for yeah. you. That's a lot of like, years uh, to be put in a business. Yeah, and we've you know, like, specialized in compliance like, and in security for you know, like, financial institutions. Uh, but we did a number of projects like Verifone, uh, Bishop Trust when they were still around, Hawaiian Trust, Bank of Hawaii, uh, First Hawaiian Bank. Uh, like Verifone was an interesting one because we went from zero to intergalactic with them. <laughs> uh, and we built custom packages for them. Uh, yeah. Like, and that was you know, a lot of work, but it was a really interesting time. That was tech uh, infancy here in Hawaii. Oh, it was. Uh, yeah. like, and, and you were there at the birth. Actually, before the birth. <laughs> and you, you had to raise our, our tech child, yes. as it were, yeah? Well, I saw you, if you go to like uh, any of the stores and you see the little Verifone unit, you know, like I saw the preliminary one that one of the owners had you know, like, come back from, I think it was from China, and he was trying to show me this is the wave of the future as far as you know, like, card val uh, validation and everything. And the little keycaps were falling off. <laughs> like, and one of my one of my uh, friends that was working for him, I said, "You should work on your resume." <laughs> 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 like, and so like that was years ago too. You know, just like, uh, so been... uh, tell me about um, the the InfraGuard okay. member alliance with the FBI uh -huh. and how you got into that. Okay, uh, we were doing uh, one of the cyber exercises at UH with the National Guard. And I had been in, in InfraGuard, you know, but I hadn't been you know, like in any position of anything. And two of the uh, FBI agents, we were on a break, and they were standing in front of me. And, like, and one of them said to the other, it's like, I heard that Russ would want to be on the board of directors. And, like, and the other one goes, oh, I heard the same thing. He'd be really good at it. Oh, like, and peer pressure. Yeah, it was oh, a perfect. little bit of peer pressure. And, like, and <laughs> I, I'm standing right behind them, and I'm trying to explain to them, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but I also knew that they were both armed. So like, I thought it would be a good thing if I went ahead. And then I got nominated as my first job would be to be president. Oh, well, good like for I you. I skipped all that board of directors stuff and all those other steps, went straight for the top. Just both feet right in. <laughs> yeah. Tell yeah. us about what the association does. Okay, the FBI InfraGuard is an outreach program from the FBI. Uh, they partner with different organizations. Uh, the whole goal of like, the InfraGuard is really to provide information out to you know, like the community uh, as far as you know, like the, the partnership goes, and also to collect information uh, and to get information from... Uh, the community. So, you know, like, uh, we have members that are uh, law enforcement. We have cyber tech people. Uh, we've got uh, you know, people from HPD, from you know, like the fire department. Uh, people that are just in the community you know, like that are members. Jeff and I. Jeff yeah. and you guys Both are now members. You know, right. like, uh, so the the goal basically is to provide a a vehicle for the FBI to disseminate information but also to be able to get information back from the community. And uh, what uh, did they disseminate in uh, particular? It, it could be you know, like what they call flashes, like which are basically the current latest stuff. So like when WannaCry was out, 
Uh, there was the Wanna Cry stuff happening mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago, well, a month and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. like, uh, that was like, showing up in the media, but also there was some stuff showing up on, you know, we've got an FBI InfraGuard site uh, that gives us a little bit more privy information sometimes. Uh, sometimes we can get the same information if we go to CNN. Uh, sometimes it'll be scrubbed like, and so that we actually get additional information. Uh, or we may actually have you know, like special meetings and stuff. Uh, we had one I don't know, a couple months ago on ransomware. Uh, it was done out at the FBI headquarters out in Kapolei, and it was done by the FBI cyber squad over here and uh, the Secret Service. So they covered a number of different things that you don't see out in the public. And you know, So what do you mean by scrub for audience now? Uh, the information is scrubbed. They'll, yeah, they'll either look for things that are you know, like issues that you know, like they don't want to divulge yet. Yeah. Um, because it may damage a case. Uh, the FBI is you know, like as far as their mandates go, uh, they basically uh, do the law enforcement, go out and chase the bad guys, uh, but then they also have to do the uh, you know, like prosecution. So they actually need to make sure chains of evidence are clean. Uh, that when they go out and do a, you know, like mm -hmm. a, the prosecution, that nothing's uh, been tampered with or like, they've done everything that they need to do as far as the due diligence. So this is a federal law enforcement organization that does what our local law enforcement and state law, law enforcement does, but across all state borders, <coughs> Yes, but only domestically. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. And they actually cover uh, Guam, uh, like the Pacific Islands and stuff, mm. like, and here. Uh, like, and they work well with you know, Pacific Region or you know, like Washington, D.C. So when did they start this InfraGuard, and what was the impetus for, for starting this alliance with the uh, members? The, the initial setup and the initial forming of it was in 1996. Well, it's been around a while. Yeah. I did not uh, know that. <laughs> yeah, with, uh, and it was done with Cleveland. Like, and it was, uh, of all places. Yeah, the, yeah, okay. The FBI organization or the you know, field office in Cleveland, uh, they looked at like, partnering with industry. And so you know, like they actually, their field office actually started it. They you know, like started working with subject matter experts you know, like in the, you know, like the Cleveland area. Mm -hmm. And once they got going, uh, it started showing up. There was a national you know, like push to move it to Washington, D.C. So you know, like FBI headquarters like got more involved in it. Uh, and then I think in 2003, uh, FBI InfraGuard you know, like National you know, like where, you know, like it was rolled out to all 56 offices. Uh, so, you know, like the local office here, they have a, a FBI coordinator that you know, takes care of us, make sure that we're not doing wrong things, you know, make sure that we're doing the right things. Um, and we have our own special agent. Like, it's like, they, uh, they gift you a special agent? Yeah. Wow, yeah. That's, that's great. He's going to shoot me for this. <laughs> <laughs> we keep them busy, though. Well, that's, okay, so how do you keep them busy? What comes back from private industry to the FBI? I, there's a number of things as far as the, like, the sites go. Uh, the InfraGuard is built up not only the InfraGuard.org site, uh, but they actually have an iGuardian site, an eGuardian site, uh, which allows you know, like Joe Consumer, you know, like business person, uh, cybersecurity guy that's working in a company to be able to you know, provide information to the Ooh. FBI and possibly to get, you know, so say you've got new ransomware showing up uh, or you haven't seen anything in the, in the media about it, there's actually a site that you can turn in, like suspic uh, suspicious activity reports, SR, and they will actually roll it up to national to see if it's been showing up someplace else also. So what you think might be just something happening, uh, maybe just in like, financial institutions, and you know two other CIOs that like uh, they mentioned something about possibly they think it was something similar, but they scrubbed the machine, like so they don't know for sure now. You know, uh, you roll it up you know, and you can see whether it's happening someplace else. Just like any other investigation, the more data you right. consume, the more conclusions you can draw from the data. Yes. And see yeah. what's the causality here, what happened first. And what's kind of interesting about it is when you, you know, like do submit information, you can submit it either anonymously uh, and you'll get kind of like filtered information as far as the anonymous stuff coming back to you. Mm. Nothing to do with anonymous guys. Right? Uh, and then that was a side joke. <laughs> oh, wait, so no mask, no, no guy mask. folks mask, yeah. right, gotcha. And then, uh, but there's also uh, a second site that you can actually upload you know, like the malware. So you can actually take and send You can you, actually send them the malware. You can send them the malware. <laughs> yeah, it's a special you know, like upside, uh, upload site. That's uh, great. But say you've you know, like actually isolated it out to some particular machine and you actually want to figure out you know, like, uh, maybe what this is or you know, like if anybody's else has seen it and they can actually take it apart. 
they'll start you know, uh, ripping apart to figure out you know, like what the codes are, you know, what kind of you know, threads are. They deconstruct you know, that code they can to de see what deconstruct yeah. it. And, right. you know, I can, so you, there's a way to actually upload you know, like actual malware to the FBI you know, on their special site. <laughs> wow, so uh, how long does it take for uh, people to find out if there's been a nationwide attack? Like WannaCry, I remember InfraGuard gave me a broadcast email. Mm -hmm. uh, but wasn't a lot of information at first. So how, how about how long does it take for, like, that was a worldwide event. Yeah, that was on May 12th, the Friday. Yeah. Like, and by Sunday, it was like at, I don't know, 60,000 sites or something like that, whatever the number. It was some we got number. up to like 200,000 yeah. computers in the, in the first week, yeah. right? It was insane. <coughs> yeah, and so there was some stuff that started filtering out like right away, uh, like within the, the next day. Uh, and then as they start rolling up information, uh, but because we have contacts into the like, cyber squad, we can actually contact uh, you know, like agents and see if they've been hearing of any upticks and stuff. Right? Because we have customers and stuff, and we're concerned about our customers. Like, is there something that, like, something else that they've heard? Uh, you guys also do events, and there's one coming up. You guys, you want to tell me anything about that event? Which one is that? Uh, the one I just got a broadcast email from last night. I, I don't uh, know exactly what it is. Let's. I, I can't tell you. I, okay. got, I have I don't to leave my computer as soon as I got it. <laughs> but uh, I know you guys have events. Could you tell uh, us about some of the events you do, the outreach to the community, okay. uh, training? Yeah, we've had, like, for 2016, we had... Actually, I'm going to cheat and look at a little bit of my notes. Because... <laughs> We had like a, a ton of things. He has notes. Yes, I've heard of those. But, uh, but we had cybersecurity you know, like research on you know, like, uh, China and Russia from a professor from uh, UH from the East West Center, uh, and she went into you know, like some really good details on you know, like what she was seeing from a research standpoint, and she was a guest speaker early in the year. Uh, Raspberry Pi, you asked about that. Which can, can be converted into just about anything. Yeah. So could so, you describe the Raspberry Pi for our audience really quick? Sure. The Raspberry Pi is a unique device that you can just buy on Amazon.com. Well, you can go to Walmart, too. And Walmart <laughs> for 85 bucks. <laughs> wow. No, but that's a kit. <laughs> that's a, that's a, it's beautiful so, that you can yeah, do this. Yeah, so Bob Monroe like, uh, did a presentation at one of our meetings, and he brought all the toys. Like he bought, and I want to say there was at least a dozen different raspberries Ooh. that uh -huh. he brought, you know, which was really neat. Because yeah. it's like you, you bring it to the candy store, like, and everybody wants, oh, can I have yeah, one of those? Yeah, yeah. Like, but he built one while talking to us. So he took it, and he described it as a Lego kind of mm -hmm. like, framework. Like, yep. And he took like uh, Nick cards, plugged it in. He took like a, like so it's a, a network interface card. He, yeah, yeah. So he put in the network interface card. He put in like a VGA for you know, talking to a monitor. He plugged in a keyboard, a small keyboard, you know, a battery pack. So the Raspberry yeah. Pi is a small component device. Three inch device. by four inch. There's a standard size, but I think it's. But about it's got three a main board and a processor, yeah. and some you can put memory in it. And you can put memory into it. You can also put in like a flash drive. Mm -hmm. So what he did on the one he had was he had, you know, like, I don't know if it was Linux or Windows, but he had on the on the flash drive, and he plugged it in, and he had an operating system, you know, like fully operational. Now, these are the devices that have been converted into uh, mock cell towers. Yeah. So they capture cells. You put this somewhere, like on a wall somewhere, and people are walking by with their cell phone, and their cell phone cellular technology passes your signal off to every tower as the signal right. diminishes from the previous tower, and it think this... This Raspberry Pi that's been configured, right? It thinks that's a cell tower. So as you're walking by, you're talking to that device, yeah, and it can capture all and your traffic. Yeah. Bob gave a, a good information on a pen testing, like you know, which was somebody that was you know, like I don't know if it was he was involved in the pen testing or not, but you know, like it was kind of interesting because they did the pen test. What they did was they were no, that's a penetration test, a penetration we, test, offensive and, security trying yeah. to break in, and right? they were tasked to you know, do a penetration testing on this company. Uh, the pen testers like they figured out that uh, the CEO was going to be on vacation on such and such a days, and what they did was they built up a Raspberry Pi, put it in a nice case so that it actually looked nice, uh, put it in a box, like and it had Wi-Fi and cellular built into it. Wow. Okay, and it had Kali Linux, like the for like doing the. That's you know, the offensive security yeah. Linux flavor with all the offensive yeah. tools. And so in they it. had all of that on yeah. there, like fully operational. Well, like, this is a big. This is a good build up, and yeah. we got to take a break. So we're okay. going to get people to come back and find out what happened. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to take a break, pay some bills. Uh, please come back. Until then, stay safe. We'll see you in just a minute. 
Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground and part two of our drama. We're hearing about <laughs> an actual <laughs> penetration test using a Raspberry Pi, which is exceedingly interesting. So let's let's get back into this. Okay. Russ, so like, uh, what they did was they used like FedEx or UPS or whatever, put this Raspberry Pi in the box, and like powered on, and like with a battery in it that would and last. had it delivered. And had it delivered <laughs> to the CEO. Really? Okay. Also, oh, so they just put it on his desk or something because so he's not there. The, like whoever the staff was, they uh, figured, oh, it's for him, so they put it on his desk. Sure. Like, and it sat there with Wi-Fi, scanning their network and scanning whatever it could find. And where there's Wi-Fi, there's a way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Never heard that one before. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it had cell capabilities. So oh. it was actually broadcasting out whatever it was discovering. It was phoning home. Yeah. And so because it had a battery, at some, time, at some point the battery would die. And so the CEO comes back, has no idea what this present is that he's got. It looks like a little Raspberry Pi. <laughs> By then, the battery had died, like, and it was a present. Like, and just part of the uh, penetration testing executive summary and results included the penetration testing results <laughs> on his desk. <laughs> now, that, that would have been great, right? If they included the flash drive with the Raspberry Pi. Here's your results. Please plug this into your computer. <laughs> gotcha. By the way, we got you again. <laughs> so what were the results of that? How, how far did they get in? Did oh, they, they actually penetrate the Wi-Fi, uh, enumerate yeah, the yeah. network, find out all the other computers? Yeah, they could, for whatever the range was for Wi-Fi at that point, you know, it was like 300 feet or whatever. Mm. It's in the middle of an office, you know, so it probably had a fairly good... So people don't know this. Uh, that's plenty. As long as you get to one system that you can compromise that's nearby, right. <laughs> you can use that as what's called a pivot, mm -hmm. right? You pivot to other systems. You can use that as a compromised computer, pivot to another system, and wander your way through the network until you find some valuable stuff and then just back your way out. How hard is it, do you think, to, to cover the tracks of something like that? I mean, they left a Raspberry Pi in there. Right, right. Right, so that's... Right. I don't know if they did any self-destruct stuff on it or not. <laughs> it's not like Mission Impossible. <laughs> it burns itself burns up, itself yeah. Up. But that's a really yeah. interesting... I, I'm gonna, so my computer club at Capulani Community College, we do penetration uh -huh. testing. That's a great idea. I, I don't think we've well, done that before. Well, we another that. thing that you can do on penetration testing is, you know, and this wasn't from InfraGuard, this is just something from my computer company. Yeah. But uh, we were doing some testing at one site, and it included, uh, you get all these new printers that have Wi-Fi capability, you know, like you, you can plug mm -hmm. in your, right. your laptop, and you're like, I don't actually need to physically plug it in, I can right. direct connect to it. So convenient. Uh, but a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of, yes it is. Yeah. And a lot of people will take that and they'll plug it into their, you know, uh, you know, into their Cat5 or into their you know, their computer into a USB so port. So Cat5 is a network cable. Ne that's right. a network cable plugged into the computer, you know, like, and so that way you've got direct connect, and the f rest of the family can use the you know, like the Wi-Fi uh, wireless connection. So you're talking about printer sharing from one computer, mm -hmm. and that computer opens up a share to the rest of the computers on the local network, so anybody else in that network can go through your computer to use the printer, or they could go directly to the printer. And just use you as a bypass. Yeah. Yeah. That, as a bridge. Just, now, the downside of that is if you haven't changed the default passwords on your printer, <laughs> on your. You know, that printer, never happens. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, you haven't changed the default passwords on the printer. We did it at one site where we actually connected into the printer. We connected wirelessly into the printer. We didn't know whether it was on uh, the floor above us or the floor below us, unfortunately. <laughs> But we were in there and we were trying to print it out and we actually created a test page and stuff to you know, print out. Now that's funny like, and you bring and up we could actually point. See, we could actually see the PC that it was connected to. Oh, that's hilarious. I could, I could go upstream. <laughs> so you bring up a great point. Mm -hmm. uh, wireless people uh, tend to think of wireless as point to point, 
-hmm. You know, I'm going between your device and my device, and my device and your device. Mm -hmm. But it's no, it's a radio. Yeah. It broadcasts in all directions all at the same time. It's a big circle yeah. of radio waves going out. Upstairs, so that's why you didn't know upstairs yeah. or downstairs, right? Because it's it's coming from somewhere. Yeah. Right? And, and it was done on a Saturday, you know, like so there was nobody in the other offices, so we couldn't tell where it was. Mm. But we had a nice clean signal. <laughs> <laughs> How nice. <laughs> so um, what do you guys do um, with the InfraGuard when it comes to uh, Things like let's get into the uh, new executive order by the president. You, it's uh, PPD 41. Yeah, let's talk about that for a little while. It seemed a little aggressive and uh, assertive. No, or? I think it's actually geared toward making all the players play together. <laughs> the you player... think it's a little overly ambitious, though, or do you think this is actually can happen this time? We've we tried before. Yeah. Yeah. I I think they basically what they tried to do is you know, define you know, who's going to be responsible for what. Okay. okay, so roles and responsibilities yeah. across organizations. So, okay. uh, Department of Justice, like through the FBI, is basically responsible for threat responses. Okay, so cyber, and it's basically cyber oriented. So, uh, threat responses. So, uh, so this, uh, threat response is we're responding to something like we cyber suspect. security. Yeah, I could, yeah. It's a suspicion of something, though. Yeah. It hasn't actually happened. It's or a threat. Or it could be in motion. Oh, it's, it could be in motion. Yeah. Okay, so it's an incident response yeah. as well. Yeah. And then uh, asset, risk, asset risk response is like Department of Homeland Security. Can you, can you describe that for our audience? Uh, basically, what kind of responses you're going to have as far as like, uh, equipment and stuff. You know, just like, are you going to have failures? Uh, like, and it may have something to do with you know, like the, you know, like the cyber area, or it may be something that they're just affecting. Uh, it might be SCADA machines or something. Uh, so SCADA machines are human machine interface or controller systems yeah, like the electric and hydraulics has, and things yeah, like hydraulics that. Hydraulics and stuff. Right. They're usually air gapped from the rest of the world. Uh, usually, but, however, people still plug USB drives into the computers yeah. that control them. Yeah. Yeah. Stuxnet <laughs> was a perfect example of it. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's let's tell our audience about Stuxnet really okay. quick, if you can. I don't that know. Really quick, Iran? is that possible? That was in Iran. That's where, Iran. Like, okay. It was a it was a targeted attack on uh, like the nuclear plants, to, I don't know if they spun them up too fast or slowed them down. Either way is bad, you know, like for you know, like a nuclear plant. So the, the, the stepper motors inside the controlled things went too fast or too slow and actually burned to a point where they couldn't they function couldn't anymore. Function. Right. And so, so you could have a potential, yeah, you could have a potential. It was on the centrifuges. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know more yeah. than I do. That's yeah. good. That's I, Sometimes. I, yeah, I and knew I should have you as a co-host. <laughs> good, good, go. good. Right. And devices like systems like that you know, need to be air gapped. Like an air gapping is basically you're not allowed to plug in that into your internet. No it, physical no, connection between no the two. Connection. So there is literally air in the yeah. gap between the two systems. And so yeah. like uh, somebody taking a flash drive and plugging it into the external devices that you're not allowed to touch, like is a perfect example of like how it crosses that air gap. Yeah. Uh, and like vendors needing to do uploads and downloads or whatever to the devices makes it like a challenge also. Uh, right, firmware updates. Yeah. And you know the uh, update the, the software on the device. Yeah. You got to bring in a flash drive or right. connect to the internet, one or the other. And so, like our local electric company, uh, you know, is the same kind of thing. All the equipment that you know, is at the power plants and stuff is all air gapped. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, if you start looking at ships, we're starting to do some stuff with maritime stuff with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, we're trying to set up a infra guard special interest group with the you know, like the local U.S. Coast Guard with District 14 mm. uh, and the maritime group. And some of the things that is, I was researching, I had to talk to them about some cybersecurity stuff. I got some maritime cybersecurity information, and it was talking about air gapping the ships. Now, could this actually help us? This partnership with the Coast Guard, could this actually help us address horrible problems like human trafficking? If we can catch these people to perpetrate these crimes using cyber probably tools? Not, probably not from InfraGuard standpoint. We might be able to pick up some, but you know, uh, I haven't heard anything on that area. Uh, doesn't mean that. So not you guys happening. deal with just mostly computer stuff. Yes. Okay. But then, if you look at something like when the ships come into port, you know, like they've got all this equipment and everything to you know, like lift the, you know, like the containers and stuff. Uh, all of those are you know, like air gap from their networks, you know, like that are on board ship, because the uh, people that are working on the ship, they you know, like do a Skype to home to say hi, Mary, how's it going? You know, I like, can just like you know, happy birthday to the kids and, and stuff. And now they're connected. And now they're that. They're connected, like they've got their own LAN, WAN, and everything else, and they've got the air gap, the equipment that needs to be kept separate. When they pull into port, you know, like 
you got all the containers, like uh, loading and unlocking equipment, mm -hmm. like it's got exactly the same kind of things. But they have to actually transfer what's on that container. Now, right. those containers, this brings up a point, since they're air-gapped, since mm -hmm. they're very contained, are they IoT devices, Internet of Things? Uh, they could be. They, they kind of qualify. They're intelligent devices, which aren't, but are sometimes, but not always, connected to the internet. Yeah, I don't know like, a lot about what they're using, but yes, it would be. So uh, it's in danger, well, like the uh, the rest of the IoT universe. Mm -hmm. Internet of, of Things is becoming a, a, a huge deal. Yeah, yeah, we had an interesting discussion after one of our InfraGuard meetings a couple months ago. Uh, now that you brought up IoT, we may as well, yeah, go. Might as well go down <laughs> there. <that laughs> yeah. Let's go. <laughs> uh, it was an after the meeting meeting kind of thing. And uh, this one lady who's a, secret serv a retired Secret Service agent, she was concerned about you know, like renting cars, like uh, re car rentals. You know, like, oh, sure, you plug in your smartphone. Yeah. Well, and you got the infotainment yeah. systems and all the car companies are trying to make it so that it's really, really good for you. And it just started this whole dialogue. <laughs> like, because uh, like one of the agents said that he had been like, renting a car on the mainland. Right. Uh, he used the Bluetooth to be able to talk Bluetooth mm -hmm. so you can get your sure. hands free and you don't get arrested. Right. You know, like, and when he finished, he had all of his GPS information, his maps, whatever he had done. He had his contacts were all in there. But when he went through the contacts, it wasn't only his contacts. It was whoever had rented the car before him. Oh, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> and that is so terrible. The, you got you to be careful, not just car rentals. Now the charging stations, I heard about this. Oh, I read yes, an article. Yeah. In the airports, they're putting up charging stations, and someone hacked the charging station. So when people go up and plug in for power, so most smartphones, power and data is the same cable. Right. Yes. You have a pin for power. You get an open wire for data. Yeah. You're plugging in. You're getting power and a lot more. You can right. be hacked that way, yeah. yeah? Well, it could be in both directions. <laughs> True, you, after, are, you can after be After I transfer it to you, then I'm going to transfer your stuff to me. <laughs> right, right. So it, we got about one minute left. Uh -huh. What do you want to tell us in our final minute as we go out? You were mentioning something about the University of Hawaii and some oh, okay. NSF funding. They have an NSF grant. Uh, Jody Ito was at our InfraGuard presentation the other day. She's a CIO? Uh, she's a CIO yeah. for CIO or CISO? I think she might be both. No, no, I think Garrett's CIO. Garrett, Garrett Yoshimi yeah. CISO. Yeah, okay. he's CIO. Okay. Right. And she does all the work. Hi, <laughs> <Right>, Garrett. <laughs> now, we've known each other for years. Uh, but there's an NSF uh, grant that they just recently got specifically to help uh, in the cybersecurity area. NSF uh, is National Science Foundation. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, thank you. You do, you do that really good. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do that. We got an audience. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, like the information and uh, stuff that we've seen on it is that you know, like it's got to be geared toward a cybersecurity. Uh, you know, uh, diploma or you know, like certificate or you know, like some kind of achievement yeah, they can yeah. they can get awarded. Yeah. But you could actually get funds you know, like for you know, like uh, you know, for the uh, the place where you're staying. You can get funds for you know, like so. There's other you know, like, uh, funds that per diem or whatever it's called uh, that you know, like would cover other you know, like things that as a student. That's that fantastic. And we just did one from the Department of Labor for the community colleges called the TACT grant. I'll uh -huh. tell you what that abbreviation stands for. It's ridiculous. But uh, um, next week, we will have um, one of our students that just completed cybersecurity training from beginning to end. He came out of no experience, and now he's a certified ethical hacker. Wow. And he went through the community colleges. So we'll have him on the show, and we'll discuss this again. Okay. Thanks for being on the show. Awesome. You were a great guest. Thank you, Thank sir. You. And as always, thank you, Mr. Perfect, for being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay, aloha, everybody. And uh, while you're out there, remember, stay safe.